In Galatians chapter 1 this evening, Galatians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 6 through verse 10, and we'll title the message uh, tonight, uh, Church of Christ or Camelism. And uh, I want to read these verses just to begin, and uh, the sermon here again will help lay a foundation for another message I'd like to preach later on. I've given you a chart that was written by a Camelite preacher or Church of Christ preacher. And there's an article uh, in the library. I did not write this, but it's been in there for probably 20 years. That's uh, quite good. And it's a bulletin brief. And so we'll begin here in Galatians. And he says in verse 6, notice with me in verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. For though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let me just stop reading right there. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege that you've given us to be able to assemble together this day. And we ask again tonight, as we did this morning, your blessings upon the reading of your word. We pray again tonight. Lord, help us with this subject. And Lord, as we consider... Uh, the doctrine, especially the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. Help us, Lord, as we look at this. Help us to look at it with open eyes and open heart. And Father, we do pray in Christ's name that you would teach us and by thy Holy Spirit that we would come to better understanding. Now, we ask your blessings again um, upon this message here tonight and the reading of thy word. And we ask these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen, and you may be seated. I don't really like to preach messages like this for a number of reasons. And one is that uh, I have a tendency to be able to try to show uh, what others believe. You have to document a lot of things, and you have to be able to quote them, not just using Scripture, but quoting uh, the beliefs of those that you're talking about. And I have before me, here on the pulpit tonight, about 15 pages of not only verses, but also of quotes. I probably have at least 50 quotes laid here. Obviously, we will not be able to go through all of these, but maybe we'll be, go be able to go through uh, a large portion of them. Now, as we come here to this subject this evening, you're going to see me looking down a lot and picking and choosing as to what I want to use this evening and what I want to uh, set aside. The chart I gave you up at the top on the right-hand side gives you about four or five leaders in, the, in, in what is uh, known as Camelism. And... Uh, and I'll, I'm going to basically talk about two of those leaders and mainly focus in on one, which is Alexander Campbell. In 1988, August the 1st and August the 2nd, I had a public debate with a Church of Christ preacher in Selma, Alabama in the Pickering Auditorium. That was 25 years ago last month. I looked at the debate, I had my wife to switch uh, the um, from VHS to DVD, and so that uh, I sat down yesterday and went over this. And I want to read you some quotes um, and statements from the Church of Christ preacher in a few moments pertaining to that. I ordered their material, I studied their material. And uh, our main issue in that debate was baptismal regeneration. Now, we had another night a debate on another subject, but I want to not get into that here tonight. 
The last few weeks on the radio station that I preach on, I've heard two messages by Church of Christ preachers on baptismal regeneration. I've listened this week to three CDs uh, by a Catholic. Uh, I don't know where he's a priest or what. And one of those CDs was dealing with baptismal regeneration. And that's what I want to really focus in on, hopefully, uh, here tonight. The Church of Christ preachers, they love to debate as their founder, Alexander Campbell. And they carry, many of them, not all of them, but many of them carry the same spirit and argumentative spirit that he had. And Alexander Campbell had said, he said that an hour of debating was more profitable than an entire day of preaching. And he did a lot of debating. Many of the Church of Christ preachers over the years uh, have debated. They love the public debates. And I have many quotes here from some of those debates. And so their slogan is where the Scriptures speak, we speak, and where the Scriptures are silent, we're silent. Now, my message tonight is not to criticize those in the Church of Christ uh, denomination. I call them a den- denomination. They deny that they are, but I believe that they are. I believe there's some saved in that denomination in spite of the teachings of the church. And I want to begin here in Galatians and the Apostle Paul, and I'm, I'm taking my time, by the way, because I, I'll probably speed up as we go along. And, uh, but I'm looking around here. I want to see exactly how I want to start with in uh, this message. And the first thing, as we have on the board up here, I want to look at the history of this religious organization and then their claim to be the one and only true church and then their belief in baptismal regeneration. Now, I have messages on baptism I have a message on difficult verses pertaining to baptism. So I may not cover all of these things here this evening because we have at least addressed those issues. Now, here in this passage, I want you to notice uh, the Apostle Paul as he writes to the churches of Galatia. And let me say this also this evening is that I understand that there's variations in and among The Church of Christ. There's conservatives and more liberals. I mean, you look at all the variations among Baptists or the Methodists or other denominations. There's a wide variety of variations. But still yet, most among the Church of Christ hold to baptismal regeneration. Now, now notice with me as we come to this. He said here in verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, you and I know tonight that salvation is centered around repentance and faith. Repent and believe the gospel. And the gospel is centered around Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel is not water baptism. The gospel is not joining a church, even though these things are good. The gospel is not coming to the Lord's table, even though that's a very good thing. You can teach me all you want after I get saved and and teach me for the next... 50 years about obedience and walking with the Lord, but you can't include all of these things in salvation. In other words, how that we enter in to the kingdom of God. So there are some that would pervert the gospel of Christ, the apostle says. He said, though we or an angel from heaven, in verse 8, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have have preached, rather, and you let him be accursed. And then he goes and says that again. Now, we know that doctrine is very, very important, according to 2 Timothy 
chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. We see there in the last days what will take place. There's been many groups that have formed since the 1800s claiming to be the true church of Jesus Christ. And that's when this group actually was formed. Now, they have many different beliefs, and I'm okay with some of the things that they believe. So, I'm not going to get into their um, uh, a cappella singing and uh, in the fact that they reject any reference to being a denomination. And I'm not, I'm not going to get into those things tonight. They do observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday. I'm not going to deal with that tonight. I think that's their business. But the two things mainly that I want to focus in on is that they believe that they're the one and only true church. That is, they are the Lord's church. And you are not. And they believe in baptismal regeneration. In other words, you're not saved until after you have been baptized in water. Now, they do claim to wear the Bible name, the Church of Christ. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Many times on some of their websites... Uh, they don't generally publish a statement of faith, I believe, as one writer said, because of potential converts. In other words, if you just put up there, uh, you know, here's the way it is. We are the one and true church and we feel this way and you must be baptized. You contact the blood and the water and things like that. It might scare off potential converts. Now, there's been debates among many people uh, is the Church of Christ, or are the Church of Christ, uh, are they considered as, an, as a cult? And uh, when you really consider all that they believe and what they teach about salvation, even though they got some things right, they're conservative, they basically stick with the Bible, they say they don't have any creeds, they believe in uh, many of the fundamentals of the faith and things of that nature, but the question is do they qualify to be a cult? Many say yes and many say no. And you'll have to make up your own mind as you read through the Scriptures and as you consider their own statements about their church and their history and, again, about how that a person is saved. I have a tendency to place them as a cult. Now, Notice with me, notice with me carefully, um, as we uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I pray that you'll stay with me tonight. I'm just, I'm trying to take it slow to begin with. I'm sure that we'll speed up a little bit, but I just, this, this is important. And it's also going to be important for another message that I will be preaching. There's about three million of them in the United States, about five million worldwide, mostly in the southern part of the United States. There's about 21 colleges sponsored by Church of Christ. There's no central office, but churches corporate uh, with one another. They have radio, television, publications, and things of that nature. And uh, so that's just a little bit of history about them. Now, their history as a religious organization. I'm going to, again, I'm going to be quoting now. And I want you to just listen carefully for a few moments. And we're, we've turned to First Timothy chapter uh, 3. And uh, in these uh, verses that we've turned to, uh, we're going to be looking. And I'm not even sure I'm going to read here. Let me get through just a few quotes uh, First of all, we may just move on uh, to Matthew in just a moment. I don't necessarily have to read here. But listen to this, uh, some of their history. Now, when you study history, of course, when you study history from the Bible, you know it's all true and correct and you can trust it. When you study man's history, there's always discrepancies and contradictions in what man writes. But I think that I can give you a good overview from what others have written and what they have written about themselves. So we can kind of get to, uh, uh, some good thoughts from uh, these two sources. In other words, I've read some of their own material. I've had interaction with them. 
Again, I've been in a public debate with a Church of Christ preacher. Uh, I've read some of the things from one of the works entitled Memoirs of Alexander Campbell, and this would, it was written by his son-in-law. Here's one quote. Church, churches of Christ grew out of the Disciple of Christ movement that began in early 1800s. Thomas Campbell organized the Christian Association of Washington, Pennsylvania in 1809, hoping to restore the apostolic practices of the early church. Now, this religious movement, known, again, as Campbellism, had its beginning primarily through the influence of two immigrants from Ireland, Thomas Campbell and his son, Alexander Campbell. Thomas came to America in 1807 and Alexander in 1809 at age of 21. They were Presbyterians when they came to America. Thomas was a pastor. They came here. Uh, he was a minister. And they were Presbyterians in the beginning. They later joined the Baptists and adopted baptism by immersion. In 18 and 12, both were baptized by a Baptist minister and were never baptized again. The founder of the Church of Christ movement, and we'll just say Alexander Campbell, was baptized by a Baptist minister. And they'll tell you today that if you're baptized by a Baptist minister or any other minister, and not intelligently believing that that baptism has to do with salvation, that you will end up in hell. Alexander Campbell became an influential leader among Baptists and was the editor of the Christian Baptist publication and worked in Baptist circles. They later, in 1830, were put out of the Baptist Association in which they later called Baptist Babylon. I think we've been called out a few times too. In 1830, Alexander and followers separated from uh, Baptists and became known as the Disciples. In 1832, they united with many of the followers of Barton Stone and later became known as the Disciples of Christ. From 1906, we have the beginning of the Church of Christ who came out and separated from the Disciples of Christ. 1906, division split. There was a left wing, the Disciples of Christ, a right wing, the Church of Christ. There was another split in the Disciples of Christ after this, and they were known as the Christian Church, which was formed. In other words, all three are called Campbellites, the Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church, and the Church of Christ. That was the entire restoration movement, and that's what they considered themselves. Not reformers, but the restoration movement, and uh, who said that they had rediscovered true Christianity of the first century, and they had already, in the early 1900s, divided and subdivided. Now, what is interesting, as I said a moment ago, and dealing with their history, and, and this is just a little repeat, but this is an article from another writer. He says in 1810, talking about uh, uh, Alexander Campbell, who was a Presbyterian, 1811, a member of his father's church of the Christian Association. In 1812, he was immersed by a Baptist preacher. In 1813, he was affiliated in union uh, with Redstone Association. In the mid and late 1820s, the Baptists began to declare non-fellowship with him. For in, in 1832, he joined forces with the Christian Church of Barton W. Stone. In 1830, he was with the disciples, uh, which were his followers. And all through the years, he tossed back and forth in his doctrinal views, eventually saying late in his life that he should have never separated from the Baptists. One, this writer says that uh, no person in the last century has spawned more cults, sects, and division than Mr. Campbell. Three major divisions came from him and from his teachings. Now, let's skip this passage here and let's turn to Matthew 16 for time's sake. Let's go to our second point, and that will keep, keep a good flow here this evening. Again, I'll skip some of the quotes with the history 
Notice in Matthew 16, the second thing we'll take a look at is their claim to be the one and only true church. Now, some will deny this, and still yet they, many do believe that. Now, there's three areas in this section here, their claims to be the one and true church. They believe that they are the restored New Testament church. You can see that on the chart that I gave you. They also believe that they're the one and only true church, that is the Lord's church. And they believe the name Church of Christ is the only scriptural name. They believe that's the only scriptural name. Now, I'm not against that name. It's a good name. But there's a problem with it if you say that that's the only name because the Lord never gave an exact name to be used for any assembly. So, first of all, let's consider the fact that they are the restored church. Here's what they're saying. The true church ceased to exist after the first century. Have we heard this before? And for about 17 centuries, you can't find it. And it has been restored, or was restored in the 1800s. You know, this leaves a lot of people out, like the Wesleys, Whitfield, Luther, Knox, Spurgeon, it leaves a lot of people out. But they believe that they restored the true church, not the reformers, but, but them. The restoration movement. Secondly, under this title, they are the one and only true church. Now, I've talked to some, they say, yes. Others say, no, we don't believe that. But they believe that their church is the Lord's church. And they only have eternal life. Those outside that church, or the church, the true church, there is no salvation. Here's a track introducing the church of Christ. This is a church of Christ preacher. He said, the Lord promised only one kind and build only one kind, there is only one body, and that one body is the church. Of course, he's referring to the church of Christ, his own denomination. In page 9 and 10 on this, in this track, he says, The church of Christ today is no more or no less than the New Testament church reproduced in doctrine and practice in the 20th century. Now, notice in Matthew chapter 16, reading one verse, in Matthew chapter 16, this is the first time the word church is used. And we find here in this passage in verse 18, and the Lord is speaking, He said, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Notice, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Think about the statement, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, God's church has never been lost since the day it was started. It has never been lost. The church has always existed throughout the centuries and millions upon millions have been saved by many different denominations and groups and whatever. The point is, the true church is a spiritual organism and not a physical organization. Now, you know I believe in the local church strongly. And I believe also in baptism with water. But not for salvation. So we see then that as we come to this passage, the Lord says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It was. It began by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been in existence for uh, since the first century. It has not ceased. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28. And notice here. As a matter of fact, the Lord even said... In 1 Corinthians 11, 26, in the first century, through the handwriting of the Apostle Paul, he said, Observe the Lord's Supper till I come. 
The Lord's church has always been here. Yes, it's been persecuted. Yes, it's been scattered. But His church has always existed throughout the centuries. In Ephesians 3, 9, God is making known the manifold wisdom of God through uh, the church or by the church of Jesus Christ. Here's another quote. This is by Campbell, Alexander Campbell himself, and uh, from Christianity Restored, page 5. And he said, Not until within the present generation did any sect or party in Christendom uh, unite and build upon the Bible alone. See the emphasis they're placing and bringing toward themselves. Walter Scott, uh, he said in 1887, uh, the true was restored for distinction's sake. It was styled the ancient gospel. In Matthew, notice with me in chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, and then we're going to move on to our uh, third point, which will be the longest. In Matthew chapter 28, uh, we read here in verse 18. I'm, I'm just picking one or two verses for time's sake. Uh, you can go back and read from verse 16 to uh, verse 20. This is the Great Commission. But he says here in verse 18, And Jesus said, or Jesus came rather, and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Well, let me, let me read verse 20. He said, Teaching them to observe all things. Now, he, he told them to go and teach. And baptize in verse 19. And he said in verse 20, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. How many believe that he will be with the church until the end of the world? It didn't cease to exist. He didn't leave the church. The church didn't leave the earth. It didn't fade out. And then was restored 17 centuries later. The church has always been here. Now, Notice with me as we turn to Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7. Now let's come to their belief in baptismal regeneration. Their belief in baptismal regeneration. In the debate that I had August the 2nd, 1988, the Church of Christ preacher put up on a big screen. Now this is a public debate. And uh, there are three, four hundred people, I think, was in, involved as, as we had this debate. And he put up on a huge screen, and he here's the way he started. He said, this is my outline, the very beginning of this debate, because he was the first to speak the second night. And he says, everything I say tonight, I'm speaking of water baptism and no other baptism unless I specifically say so. Here is his 20-point outline. I wrote it down from the video yesterday. I spent three, three hours with this and to make sure I get it right. And here is his outline. Now listen to this. Mark 16, this is number one. He said, baptism stands between the sinner and salvation. Two, Acts 2.38, baptism stands between the sinner and remission of sins. Number three. Acts 22.16, baptismal stands between the sinner and washing away of sins. Number four, Acts 8.39, baptism, baptism, he's talking about water now, baptism stands between the sinner and rejoicing. Acts 22.16, baptismal stands between the sinner and calling on the name of the Lord. Number six, Romans 6.3, baptismal stands between the sinner and the death of Christ. Number seven, Romans 6.4, baptism stands between the sinner and the blood of Christ. Romans 6.3, baptism stands between the sinner and getting in Christ. Number nine, Colossians 2.12, baptism stands between the sinner and resurrection. Uh, number ten, Romans 6.4, baptism stands between the sinner and new life. And number eleven, Galatians 3.27, baptism stands between the sinner and putting on Christ. Number 12, uh, Ephesians 5.26, baptism stands between the sinner and cleansing. Number 13, baptism stands between the sinner and sanctification. Number 14, 1 Corinthians 6.11, baptism stands between the sinner and justification. Number 15, 2 Corinthians 5.17, baptism stands between the sinner and becoming a new creature. 
Number 16, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, baptism stands between the sinner and the one body. Number 17, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, baptism stands between the sinner and receiving the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Number 18, Titus 3, 5, baptism stands between the sinner and regeneration. Number 19, baptism in John 3, 3 and 5. Uh, stands between the sinner and entrance into the kingdom of God. And number 20, Matthew 28, 19, we just read, baptism stands between the sinner and relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you see what he's just done there? Every verse from Titus 3, 5 to John 3, 5, to Romans 6, verses 3, 4, and 5, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, every verse, even the verses that speak of spiritual baptism, He has made it water, and He's saying that you can't be saved, regenerated, put in Christ, have new life, uh, uh, have the blood of Christ to be sanctified, justified, to be a new creature, any of these things, enter into God's kingdom, have a relationship with God. He says you can have none of these things until after you have been baptized. With water. So they teach that baptism is necessary for salvation. This is very clear. I've got about 50 quotes here and I'll give you a few of those. They teach that baptism places one in Christ and they teach that baptism places one in the church, because to be in Christ and in church and in the body all means the same thing to them. So they teach you have to have faith, you have to have repentance, public confession, and water baptism by immersion. Not by sprinkling or by pouring. Again, think about over the centuries, the many, the many that would not enter in if, if, if you contact the blood and the water and you have to be immersed, I believe in immersion, but I believe the man is sprinkled or poured that he's just as saved as I am. How many of you can say amen to that? If he's trusted Christ, if he's repented of his sins, and he's believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what denomination he's in or where he's from, and if he's been sprinkled or it's been poured on him or he hadn't been baptized at all as a thief on the cross, he's just as saved as you and I are because he's repented of his sins and he's put his faith in Jesus Christ, believing that Jesus Christ shed his blood for him that he might enter into the kingdom of God. Now listen to this carefully. Here's, here's, some, more, here's some quotes. These are quotes from Church of Christ leaders, some from their own publication, some from debates, dealing with regeneration, remission of sins, uh, conversion, sins washed away, contacting the blood and the water, pardon, etc. Now listen carefully. Now the first several, the first whole page, we'll just quote from Alexander Campbell himself. He is their leader, right? And so we just quote from him. He says, Immersion is that act by which our state is changed. Another quote, Christian immersion frequently called conversion as the act inseparably connected with the remission of sins. Another quote, immersion is the converting act. No person was said to be converted until he was immersed. Another quote, the act of immersion or soon as our, I'm sorry, or soon as our bodies are put under water at that very instant our former or old sins are washed away. Now, this is from Alexander Campbell. I had another quote. In the very instant in which he was put under water, received the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, Christian immersion is the gospel in water. Another quote. He said, The change which is consummated by immersion is sometimes, now listen to this, is sometimes called in the sacred style being quickened or made alive, passing through death to life, being born again, having risen with Christ, turning to the Lord, being enlightened, conversion, reconciliation, repentance unto life. Another quote by him, 
He says, none but those who have first believed the testimony of God and have repented of their sins and have been intelligently immersed into his death have the full and explicit testimony of God assuring them of pardon. You know what he means when he says intelligently immersed? Here's what he means. And here's what they mean. If you came along and you said to the average Church of Christ preacher, I know there's a little variation, but you said to the average Church of Christ preacher and you said, you know, I got saved, I was saved, I was born again, I trusted Christ as my Savior, you know, ten years ago, and then after I was saved, I followed the Lord in baptism. In other words, I believe that that was, you know, uh, being obedient to the Lord, but I was saved before I was baptized. He's going to say that you were not intelligently immersed. Because you have, when you get baptized according to their theology, you have to believe that that water has something to do with regeneration. You see, you see where I'm coming from? You have to believe that the water baptism has something to do with regeneration, and it's when you come up out of the water that you are saved, you are sanctified, you are justified, not before you go in the water. They believe that your faith is dead until you come out of the water. Another quote by him, he said that the unimmersed person is still unpardoned, unjustified, unsanctified, unreconciled, unadopted, and lost to all Christian life and enjoyment. Another quote by him, he said, Flee to the sacred ordinance which brings the blood of Jesus in contact with our consciences. Another quote, he said, Regeneration and immersion are two names of the same thing. Another quote by Campbell, he said, We connect faith with immersion as essential to forgiveness. Another quote, he said, You meet the blood of Christ in water baptism and nowhere else. And then he says, Our garments are washed by blood the same way our sins are washed by water. Quotes. Yeah, here's some more quotes. And this is taken from some of their publications and some of their debates. One author, he said, Baptism is essential to salvation. Shouting from the rooftop, man must be baptized to be saved. Another writer, he says, Con- you contact the blood in the water. That's 1976. Another writer, uh, Thomas Warren, in, in the spiritual sword, January 1974, he said, before one is baptized in obedience to Christ, he is still a child of the devil. No matter how much you believe, until you're baptized, you're still a child of the devil. Another writer, he says, faith before immersion is dead faith. J.A. Harding says, yes, faith is dead before baptism, so I teach. Nashville debate. Another writer said, if a man is not baptized in obedience to the will of God, faith is without the works of obedience, without the works of God's righteousness, and therefore dead faith. Another writer says, until faith obeys, it is dead, as James says it is. Faith alone leaves people children of the devil. It is the obedient or or baptized believer that is saved. That was written in April 1977. Another writer says the water is the mother. That's Campbell. You know why he says that? The mother gives birth. You understand where we're coming from? He also says water is the only door into the kingdom. No, this is by another author in January 79. Another author said, by water one receives spiritual life. By water one contacts the blood. That's 1976. By water one is freed from being handcuffed and wearing the leg irons and the balls and chains of the devil and delivered from the prison house of Lucifer. Another one said, water makes children of God. Another said, water makes the soul as white as bride's wedding dress. Water makes all, I'm sorry, let me start over. Another quote, water makes an all new spiritual person. Another quote, water brings to the blessing of salvation or security. Another writer says, until one is baptized, he is lost, no matter how fervently he believes, repents, or prays. Written in 1979 in January. Another writer said, newness of life follows the burial. 
Talking about baptism, it does not precede it. Newness of life follows baptism, burial. It does not precede it. Another writer said, well, this is Campbell here, uh, taken from the Campbell-Rice debate. He says, uh, Christian immersion is the gospel in water. One more. Baptism is a commandment of God, a procedure that puts one into Christ where salvation is found. Baptism is accomplished by being immersed in water, not sprinkled. We can come to the conclusion by their own writings, their own leaders, that they believe in baptismal regeneration, even though some of them say we do not. But from their own writings, their own leaders and so forth, we find that they definitely teach in baptismal regeneration that a person is not saved no matter how much they believe or how much they repent or how much they pray or how much they receive. One is not saved until they're immersed, not sprinkled, not poured, but they're immersed in the water. And once they come out of that water, next week I'm going to give you some quotes, um, but once they come out of that water... Then they are regenerated, they're born again, they're justified, they're sanctified, they come out as new creatures with a living faith. They were birthed in that water and the blood of Jesus Christ was applied to them. I call that heresy. And I call that false doctrine. Some considerations, as I've already said, and we're in Luke chapter 7. They do teach that faith is dead before baptism. They do teach that regeneration is not an inner working of the Holy Spirit, but is through the water baptism. They do teach that you must be intelligently intelligently immersed. In other words, you've got to believe that this has something to do with your salvation. They do teach that you contact the blood and the water, however that would happen. And they do teach that a works, they do teach a works based salvation. In other words, they're putting the cart before the horse. We believe in many things that are common among other denominations, but we do not believe that you're saved by these things. I was listening to these CDs this week, and, and, and this preacher, whatever he is, is saying that some of the same things, just through the water. That you're, you're birthed again and goes on and elaborates reading verse after verse after verse. Now notice as we come here to this passage, and I want you to notice that, and these are just some considerations, that, that salvation and baptism are closely connected in the New Testament. Uh, and, and there is, in other words, when we come to the New Testament, the New Testament does not recognize unbaptized believers. All believers follow the Lord in baptism. How many can say amen to that? I mean, obviously the thief on the cross could not do that. But you come through the book of Acts and and even in John's ministry and the book of Acts, and those who receive Christ as Lord and Savior, they followed the Lord not only in their faith, but they followed Him in baptism. They become identified with Him. And so he says here in Luke chapter uh, seven, and this is John the Baptist preaching in verse 28. And he said in verse 29, all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God. Notice they declared God to be just and be right, being baptized with the baptism of John. Now in verse 30, we find here, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God. The baptism didn't save. But when they rejected the counsel of God, they refused to be baptized. Baptism always followed uh, belief. It's the mark of salvation. It's the identification of salvation. Uh, We find it is like the seal of faith. It doesn't regenerate. It doesn't save. But it was important because it was a symbol of separation, uh, you know, unto Christ from uh, the world. I want you to take uh, with me Mark uh, chapter 16. Now, again, I've, I've got a message on baptism about 
four years ago. I got one about five years ago dealing with difficult verses. So I'm just going to briefly touch upon these in the, la- in the next uh, 85 minutes that we have. Uh, <laughs> notice with me as we come. It would literally take that long if we uh, uh, went through all of this because we're already 45 minutes uh, in, in the message. But let's consider just a few thoughts uh, as we come to, come to the book of Mark. Now, you and I know that in the Old or New Testament, an ordinance never saved anybody, right? Even the Passover. Uh, the Passover was called a memorial. It was called an ordinance. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. It commemorates the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we know that uh, the sacrifices, the ordinances, uh, all of those things, none of those things ever saved anybody. We also know that there's a lot of symbolic language in the Bible. Jesus said in John 6 and verse 53, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. They knew what He was saying. And He's talking about truly believing upon Him as the Messiah, as the Savior. Also in Matthew 26, when Jesus Christ you know, uh, instituted the Lord's Supper, He took the bread, He took the juice. And he took the bread and he said, this is my body. He took the juice he said, this is my blood. Now, we know that the bread and the, the, the fruit of the vine is not the literal body and the literal blood of Christ. We've got enough sense to know that, but there's some denominations that teach that it is. And he's, he's saying that this represents the bread is bread. The water is water. The water is not blood. The water is not spirit. The juice is juice. You know, the bread is bread. It, we're talking about symbolic things that represent something else. Okay? And, and so, I'm simply saying to you that in many places you'll find statements and what you want to do is either let the context determine the interpretation and also back up and look at the big picture. When you have three or four difficult verses, and there are a few difficult verses, you have three or four difficult verses on uh, baptism. And then you have 300 verses that are plain and clear, that talk about salvation by faith in Christ, not by works of righteousness which we have done. You have all these other verses. We would want to interpret the obscure or difficult verses in light of the clear verses and not vice versa. So their favorite verses on baptism is Mark 16, 16, John 3, 5, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21, and Galatians 3, 27. Now, there are some others that they manipulate. But these are some of their favorite verses. Now, notice with me in Mark, and I'm going to be reading in chapter 16 and one verse. We'll take as many as these we can and then we'll stop. He says here in Mark chapter 16, we find in verse 16, he says here, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, they don't touch any of the other verses in the passage that deals with signs and casting out devils, laying on of hands and so forth, but they come to this passage and they make a big, big issue out of it. Now, this is a proof text of the church of Christ. Again, they'll ignore hundreds of other verses. What is this verse saying? In this same book, in Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 14 and 15, we know that Jesus Christ came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and He said, repent and believe the gospel. We know that baptism is not the gospel. Baptism is important. The Lord's Supper is important. These are gospel ordinances. Many things are important. Church membership is important. Many things are important. Reading your Bible is important, but that's not how you got saved, right? Going to church is important, but that's not how you got saved. So what is he talking about? Well, this verse does not say, if not baptized, you shall be damned. He said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth what not shall be damned. 
You can be baptized and still not be saved. There's many in the world who've been baptized and never been saved. It is the sin of unbelief that damns a soul to hell. And again, I told you a moment, moment ago that salvation and baptism, they are closely connected together because everyone in the Bible that I know of, except the thief on the cross, after they got saved, they followed the Lord in baptism. So the unbeliever is condemned, not the unbaptized person in the passage. Nowhere does it say anyone is condemned, lost, or damned because they have not been baptized. But again, baptism is important. But there is no such thing as baptismal regeneration in the Word of God. Now, what is somebody, what is somebody, uh, uh, said they got saved and refused to be baptized? You showed them in the scripture that you're to follow the Lord, in believers' baptism, be like the Pharisees and lawyers in Luke chapter uh, 7, and they said, no, I, I just refuse to follow, then you could probably assume that they haven't truly got saved. Even Paul himself was saved three days before that he was baptized. When Ananias came to him, he was blind for, for three days. Turn with me to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5. And notice here, John chapter 5. This is another proof text of the church of Christ. One writer, and uh, I don't know this is the greatest illustration, but he said, suppose I say, um, uh, he that getteth on a jet and sitteth down shall fly to California. But he that getteth not on the plane shall not fly to California. He said, getting on the plane is the determining factor, not sitting down. And he goes on to say, if one gets on the plane, he should sit down. It would be proper to sit down, but he will make the trip whether or not he sits down. So it is with baptism, we should be baptized. But baptism don't get us into the kingdom of God. May not be the best illustration, but it is true. In 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 the book of John, you will notice with me in chapter three, and we we've uh, taught the book of John, we've uh, uh, worked on this a number of times, and so let me just briefly uh, take one verse and point out what they teach here about this in John uh, chapter uh, three, verse five is their proof text, and Jesus Christ is speaking to Nicodemus. And uh, he's telling Nicodemus that he uh, needed to be born again. He said in verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And of course, Nicodemus begins uh, asking the question, and he, Nicodemus is speaking in the physical, and Jesus Christ is speaking about spiritual things. Um, and Nicodemus says, how can a man, verse 4, when he is old, in, can, you know, enter, can he enter in the second time? Into his mother's womb and be born? He's talking, Nicodemus is thinking on the first birth, the natural birth. He said, how can this happen again? Of course, we know that it can. And Jesus then says in verse 5, He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, they say this is water. And every other text that you come to, whether it be Titus 3, 5, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Romans chapter 6, Galatians 3, 27, every one of these verses they say water, water, water. All they can see is water. Every time they see a verse that uses the word uh, baptism or baptize, and this verse, the, these verses don't even have the word baptize or baptism. So what have we got here? Well, there's ignorance in verse 4 of spiritual truth. In verse 5, Jesus Christ speaks of a natural birth of water and a spiritual birth here in this passage that will allow somebody to enter into the kingdom of God. We know that there's, that the, the baby inside a mother's womb is surrounded by fluid, surrounded by water, even when it's time for the baby to come. What do we usually hear? Her water broke. 
And, and the baby is surrounded in this, so it's speaking of the water of the womb. Now, there's many interpretations of this, but why do I say that? Verse 4, Nicodemus is thinking of his mother's womb and being born. And then in verse 6, Jesus says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, the first birth. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, verse 7, that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. I don't think that's complicated. I don't think that's hard. He's talking, he's saying to Nicodemus, it's not good enough to just be born into this world, a natural birth. He said, you need to be born again, born of the Spirit, born from above. Turn with me please to Acts chapter 2. In the book of Acts, notice with me in chapter 2. Now these are the verses that they run to, that they tune in on, and ignore actually many other verses that are in the Bible, but these are the ones that they pick out. They're, they're not always the easiest verses. You have to think about them. You have to consider the context. You have to consider the big picture. You have to consider the entire New Testament, what is said in, in other places also in the New Testament, because we know that one passage will not contradict another passage, right? Now, what I want to do here... I want you to just be thinking ahead as I say a few things about Acts 2. And again, we have a message on difficult verses that we've preached in the past, so I'm just going to briefly say a few things. But I want you to be thinking, the same preacher here on the day of Pentecost, Peter, he also is preaching in Acts 10. And we're going to turn there in just a moment. He's preaching in Acts 10. And I want you to think about something. While he's preaching in Acts 10, the Spirit of God falls upon some people and then later they get baptized. Okay? So just keep that in mind as we read this. He says here in Acts chapter 2, reading in verse 38, for time's sake, I'm just going to the particular verses. He said, Then, then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot can be said about this verse. We find that it's basically, again, in the New Testament, there is no such thing as an unbaptized believer. This is something that automatically follows. Baptism is for remission of sins only in the sense that it is the testimony that we have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. The word for, this little word for, there's a lot of theology and doctrine formed around this little word for. Verse 38, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That word for has a number of different definitions in the Greek, in the English, and in the King James Bible. One definition in the Webster's 28, 18, rather 28 dictionary on page 11 is in order to obtain. That's what the Church of Christ say. You are baptized, you repent, you're baptized in order to get remission of sins. But there's another definition which is in the Webster's 1828 on number 14, not page, but number 14. And it says because of or on the account of. This is true in the Greek. This is true in the English. For instance, let me give you an example. In Luke 5, verses 12 through 14, there's a leper that came to Jesus and wanted to be cleansed. And so the leper was cleansed. Jesus made this leper clean in verse 13. And yet in the next verse, verse 14, Jesus tells him to offer a sacrifice for cleansing and for testimony. But he's already cleansed by Jesus before he goes to offer a sacrifice for cleansing to the priest and for a testimony. And again, this, these thoughts are seen throughout the New Testament. The little Greek word for for, E-I-S, see the ace or ice, the pronunciation, and it can mean looking forward or looking back. 
And I believe the context has to help understand the meaning and also other doctrines or other truths that you find in the Bible. Like in Luke chapter 11, verse 32, the word for is used. And a parallel passage, the Bible becomes its own dictionary and commentary. In a parallel passage in Matthew 12, 41, the word because is used for the word for in these two books. So it's the same context. Luke says for, Matthew says because, but it's the same account, same context, same speech. In other words, it says, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And the other passage said, because uh, they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And not only that, I wrote this down so that I would not forget it. This little Greek word, E-I-S, is translated for, but it is also translated in the New Testament in another in a number of other ways, like into, unto, upon, or toward. For instance, in Matthew 12, 41, repented at, at, that's the same Greek word translated for is translated at, repented at the preaching of Jonas. Matthew 3, verse 11, baptism uh, unto repentance. Again, that Greek word translated unto. It cannot mean in order to have, but it means because of the repentance. And again, you can go through a number of passages where this is true. And to illustrate this, many times in the New Testament, the Greek word is translated for, again, it means because of or on account of, and I have a list beginning in Hebrews 5.3. If I said to you this evening, I'm going to take an aspirin for a headache, what am I saying? Am I saying to you I'm going to take an aspirin for a headache so I can obtain a headache? Or acquire a headache? Or because I have a headache? If I say to you I got a ticket for speeding, was that ticket so I could speed or because I was speeding? You see what I'm getting at? This word for, again, can be used a number of different ways. Now, why would I say... In Acts chapter 2, why would I say that it's used in the sense of because of? I would say that in light of all the other texts that we have associated with salvation and how to get in Christ and how to be saved and how to receive remission of sins. Notice in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10. Notice here beginning in verse 43, and if you're taking notes, you can also write down Acts 11, 15 through 18. He says here in, in verse 44, he said, And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. What is Peter, Peter preaching? He's saying in verse 43, he's, he's saying that, uh, that whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. That's what he's preaching in Acts 2, remission of sins. And so here he's saying, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. He's preaching to Gentiles, to Cornelius and his household. And it says, While Peter is yet, uh, yet spake these words, notice the Holy Ghost fell on them and which heard the word. They haven't been baptized yet. And he goes on to say, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have, notice this, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? They were saved. They received the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and they had the evidence of biblical tongues, not what you hear today, but biblical tongues. And then he commanded them in verse 48 uh, to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. You see, the same preacher that's preaching in Acts 2 said, repent and be baptized. The same preacher is preaching in Acts 10, 
And we find here that the Spirit of God is given to them before they went into the water. Are you with me tonight? Okay, and so, so we're all together here. And then he elaborates more on this in Acts 11, verse 15 through 18. He speaks of the light gift, the Spirit of God, and repentance unto life. In other words, Cornelius is saved. His household is saved before they went under the water. One Church of Christ preacher said, We are compelled to recognize that this coming of the Spirit was Holy Spirit baptism. Cornelius and his household received Holy Spirit baptism, but they were not saved by the Holy Spirit baptism. The fact is that the Holy Spirit baptism has nothing to do with one's salvation. Written in 1976. Another Church of Christ preacher says the conclusion that Cornelius was an unsaved man at the time he received the Holy Spirit is demanded by the evidence. God did therefore in this instance send the Holy Spirit upon unsaved people, although Cornelius and his household was baptized in the Spirit, this baptism had not saved them. Well, what did it do? Why did it come? Why did it come upon them? If they weren't saved, that was January 1979. In other words, they're saying baptism begins a new life, water baptism. A Baptist preacher said they teach that Cornelius and household were children of the devil, yet were baptized in the Holy Spirit and had the gift of tongues as the apostles and were still lost before water baptism. And that's what they're saying. These people have the Spirit of God. They have the gift the gifts of the Spirit, and they're rejoicing in this before they ever were saved. And yet the church Christ preacher is saying they were still children of the devil because they hadn't been put in the water yet. Because they believe in baptismal regeneration, contacting the blood, and being sanctified and justified as they come up out of the water. No new life until you go under and then you come up out of the water. Turn with me to Acts chapter 22. I'll tell you what, we're, we're running out of time. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're just going to have to close here. I'm going to just give you the other references. I'll just give them to you. Because we're already, we're almost 70 minutes into this message. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 12. Now, in Acts chapter 22, let me give you this. This is another one of the uh, verses. In Acts 22, where the Apostle Paul, Saul, at the time was saved, and it, it's, it's recorded in Acts 9, Acts 22, I think, Acts also 26. But Acts 22.16, uh, the Bible says there when Ananias came, said uh, that he is to rise. He said, be baptized and wash away thy sins. You think, well, that's a little difficult. Kind of like Mark 16.16, 16, Acts 2.38. And you say, but, but again, let's think about the context. And let's think about in light of other verses. Okay? Now, we are told in the Bible and other places that were washed in the blood. And then here in Acts 22, he says, Be baptized and wash away thy sin. Well, is it water or is it blood? Well, the church Christ say you contact the blood in the water. We know that doesn't work. Now, if the water is a symbol of the blood, then it fits, does it not? I mean, the statement doesn't really bother me. Uh, the, the animal sacrifice wouldn't save. Water won't save. The ordinances never save. It does not contradict other verses. Baptism is a picture of the cleansing from sin. How many would say amen to that? It's a picture of that. But here is the thing. When you go back and read Acts 9 of Saul's conversion, you will find when the Lord appeared to him in that vision, blinded him on the road to Damascus, by the way, Damascus has been in the news a lot here lately. That's an old city. And you'll find that while Paul was waiting, blinded, waiting for Ananias, that the Bible says he was fasting and praying. There have been three days. He was a believer. And he's fasting and praying. 
And not only that, when you read in verse 13 of Acts 22, and also Acts 9.17, when Ananias came to him, he said, Brother Saul, he's not talking as a national brotherhood. In other words, we find that he's of the same faith. The Lord has spoken to Ananias as a believer. Now the Lord has spoken to Saul. He's a believer. They're brothers in Christ. They're the same family. So when he comes to him before he's baptized him, he said, Brother Saul, you don't call a lost man a brother in Christ. So in, in my opinion, there's the answer to that. We just look at the text. We think about the context. We think it through. We, we put it together with other verses. And I believe we come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as baptismal regeneration. I believe it's a damnable heresy that we find in this organization. 1 Peter 3.21 is another passage where it talks about baptism doeth now uh, save us. And it's dealing with Noah, the ark. We know the ark was the instrument of their deliverance. We know the water demonstrated uh, their safety in lifting the ark above the destruction of the flood waters in the days of Noah. Before Noah got on the ark, the Bible says that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord in Genesis 6 and verse 8. The man was saved before he ever got on the boat. And, but it was the ark that saved, that saved him. And he says, he says that that is a like figure. A figure is not the real thing. And he also says that the baptism and, uh, and the like figure, he said, it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It will not take away sin. And he also says in verse 22 of that passage, it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. When we receive Christ, we repent of our sins and we trust Him as Lord and Savior, then we are baptized. It is an answer of a good conscience that we believe in Christ and in His resurrection and that He is our hope and that He is our Savior. Noah's safety was in the ark. And uh, and that was revealed by water. The water did not procure it, His safety, but it declared it. Now notice as we come here to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, watch this carefully. He says, For by one Spirit... Are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit? Now, I don't have time to elaborate on that. We're already at 73 minutes. I've got to quit in just a few moments because this thing runs out about 78. We have 80 minutes, but you can't run it to, to the end. He said, by one Spirit, are we all baptized into one body? This is spiritual spirit baptism here. Just like in Galatians 3.27, we've been baptized into Christ. He's talking about spiritual baptism. Baptism is important. The Lord's Supper is important. Church membership is important. Many other things are important. But baptism in, in, in the Lord's Supper and church membership is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what about all the saints have been sprinkled uh, throughout the centuries? Uh, where do they stand with God? Are they saved or are they in hell? What about the ones like the thief on the cross that couldn't be baptized? There have probably been many in prison and, and persecuted that the same thing has happened to them. I'm simply saying to you that baptismal regeneration, and that's what we've focused in on here tonight, I believe that it is heresy. And I gave you the quotes from the Church of Christ people. This is, this is not my words. I'm, I am giving you my opinion as to what I believe the Scriptures say about this, but I gave you their own words. And, uh, and I, I, just, I just believe it's damnable heresy. Well, I've said enough. Shall we stand?